Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the theater at the Ace Hotel for the 13th talk in the Broad's Unprivate Collection Series with artist Thomas Hausago and musician Flea. I'm Joanne Heiler, the founding director of the Broad Museum and the Broad Art Foundation. We began this unprivate collection conversa conversation series two years before the opening of the Broad as a way to present LA audiences with unique, accessible dialogues between artists in the collection and a wide range of cultural leaders. Our past unprivate collection conversations have included Eric Fischel with actor and comedian Steve Martin, artist Kara Walker with filmmaker Ava DuVernay, and artist Robert Longo with musician and writer Henry Rollins, and many, many more. These talks are meant to inspire people to come to the Broad Museum itself, and it seems they've done their part. Over one million people have visited since our opening 16 months ago. Thank you. We continue to be at capacity every day, with thousands coming to enjoy the collection every day, and also enjoy our provocative building designed by Liz Diller of Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro. We're thrilled that our visitors, and hopefully many of you, have made the Broad into the vibrant public arts resource that our founders, Eli and Edie Broad, hoped it would be. 2017 promises to be an exceptional year at the Broad. In late spring, we'll present our newest first floor installation. It's going to be called Oracle, and it will examine how contemporary artists in our collection respond to opaque systems and forces at work in our interconnected and globalized society. And in October, we will present Yayoi Kusama, Infinity Mirrors, an in-depth look at Kusama's career-long focus on the idea of infinity through nearly 100 works that include drawing, paintings, sculpture, and six infinity rooms. Fingers crossed that Instagram servers can handle this. <laughs> uh, now a bit about tonight. Our conversation tonight brings together two iconoclasts from LA's art and music worlds, Thomas, Hausago, and Flea. Thomas Hausago, born in Leeds, England, spent time studying in London and Amsterdam before arriving in, L in LA 2003. His work caught the art world's attention about a decade ago with large scale often enormous and imposing figural sculptures that seem animistic, almost brutal, but also hint at a dialogue with the century-old language of modernism. His sculpture, drawing, and painting dissect that past while opening a wide-angle lens onto the future. One of Thomas's extraordinary works shown for the first time in LA is the centerpiece of our current show at the Broad, Creature, that's on view till March 19th. If you've visited, you've seen it. It's called Cyclops sort of a time machine superhero that's part wounded giant. It's standing watch over our huge first floor galleries that just barely contain it. It has expansive energy, which is not unlike Thomas's expansive and wide ranging intellect, which you will see in a moment. Uh, Thomas is joined by musician, actor, nonprofit founder, and art collector Flea. While Flea is best known as the bassist for the Grammy award-winning band, The Red Hot Chili Peppers, his career is incredibly varied. He's appeared in films that span many genres from Back to the Future, part two and three, to Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, to voicing the character Donnie in Nickelodeon's animated series and films, The Wild Thornberries. <laughs> Flea is also the co-founder with Keith Berry of the Silver Lake Conservancy of Music, a nonprofit organization dedicated to facilitating music education for underserved children. That's right. Flea and Thomas have a friendship stretching back several years. Flea is a major admirer of Thomas's work. I know this for a fact because many times I visited Thomas's studio on the museum's behalf, and he right away tells me what Flea thinks about the new work. <laughs> a couple of quick details. Please silence your cell phones and note that tonight's talk is also being watched by an online audience via live video stream at thebroad.org. We'll have Q&A at the end, and audience members and online viewers are invited to tweet questions for both Thomas and Flea using the hashtag HouseAgoFlea. 
hope you know how to spell that. Um, Thomas and Flea, as you may have noticed from your period before we started our program, have prepared music playlists that were playing earlier, and they'd like to share them with you. They can be found on the Broads website, uh, for, um, on the web page for tonight's event. Finally, I want to gratefully acknowledge U.S. Trust for their generous support of tonight's program. And with that, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Thomas Hausago and Flea. Hello. Hi, Abe. Hi, Abe. Hi, B. Hi, B. Hi, Muna. Hi, Muna. Hi, Hi other kid. <laughs> Hi, other kids. <laughs> it's so nice that there's kids here. Ow, kids! And watch out, we might swear. There's a possibility we could swear or We might or say fucker shit, but if we do, Asshole. just, you know, it's art. It's for the sake of art. Art and politics. Only about yeah. Donald Trump. I only, only yeah. swear about Donald Trump. Um, I'm, I'm going to make matches. You're going to make matches. Just so, a ritual. So um, he's from England, and I'm not. So he says matcha, and I say <laughs> matcha. But we both enjoy tea. Um, Thomas. Yeah. Speaking of you being English. Yep. I was thinking this morning while, while I was having breakfast about doing this today, and I was like, Oh shit, tonight we have to do that thing. <laughs> and, and I was thinking about you being from Leeds in England. Yep. And about, I don't know, six months ago or something, I was flying in a helicopter and we went over Leeds. And I was looking down and I was like seeing all these, like I was pretty low because I was going to play a show there in true rock star fashion in a helicopter. And that I, happens. When I go to Leeds, there's no helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just tell you, the trains in Leeds are a nightmare, but yeah. So, I was thinking, I was looking down and I was seeing these little communities, like these rows of tight little houses together I, and like going over these kind of like, um, you know, it was like the hood in Leeds. Yeah. And I was, I was thinking, um, what it, I was imagining you de being down there just like this wild, angry kid <laughs> running around in the street being dirty and crazy. Yes. And um, like just an upright, you know, ferocious Thomas as a child, and I was wondering, you know, I have no idea. I just had this like daydream about what it was like for you. What was it like when you were a kid? You know, it's, it's um, you know, uh, it's unbelievable that this many people are here, first of all, because you, when you just left, you reminded me there was a huge order. I thought we were alone for a second. Yeah. Cause like, so let me get, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing because I think time is, is strange, right? You, you, you bring certain things towards you. So just recently, when I opened the show here in LA, by some strange happenstance, when I grew up in Leeds, my next door neighbor was a very famous art historian called T.J. Clark, okay? Who was like a Marxist art historian. And all the Marxists and all the hardcore radicals would come from the south of England and they'd set up at like Leeds or Manchester to look at the misery, you know? Like to, to really get in it. I mean, it's hard if you're in you like, mean like Surrey. like studying like the social... Yeah, the, like, yeah I mean, yeah. The, the Industrial Revolution began there. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Marxist, it's, it's like visiting the pyramids, you know? Right. It's like you're, you're delighted. And by some bizarre, absolutely unbelievable weirdness, he lived next door when I was about this age. Let's pull up an image, because you're number three. Number three. That's me. Uh, you said I was a wild guy. I think what's important uh. to flag <laughs> is, what I'd like to flag is Leeds is not near the ocean and I'm wearing a fucking face mask and flippers. You don't yeah. see the flippers? Yeah. And a filthy, note how filthy the cape is. Yeah. I like to rock a filthy cape. Anyway, long story short, TJ Clark, by some bizarre thing, was in LA. I hadn't seen him in 14. Recently, he was in LA and for my opening. Right. And I walk into my opening and I recognize Have him. Have you stayed in touch with him the whole time no, since you were a kid? No, have not seen his but face. But he knew who you were. He knew you were the kid well, next he, door. Well, you know, he was kind of like, well, you know, you got this opening, I'm, you know, yeah. and I was like, yeah, please come. And yeah. through the art world, and yeah. he's probably gone through a trip like, what, that scruffy little devil yeah. is now like, 
So to a long story short, when I'm in the, the opening, you know, he said, I just got to tell you something. And he's a very kind of dignified, he's an art historian. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, you used to come over to, and I loved his son, this guy called Sam. Mm -hmm. And they stayed a while and then they disappeared. Like all the university people, they'd like come for a year or two, smell it, taste it and mm -hmm. go, you know, go back to Devon or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I loved his son. His son was like a hippie and you go over to the house and they had like strange plants and books and like sexy things, you know, like weird sexy pictures. And I'd always thought I came across really well. And he was like, you used to come over and you would steal food and you would get, you would cover yourself, you would strip down to your underwear and cover yourself in dirt in our back garden and then run the dirt through the house. And I was sort of at my opening, this is two yeah. weeks ago, like, I don't remember that. I remember yeah, yeah. us discussing <laughs> yeah. Lacan, you know? Yeah, yeah. So a long story short was that was a blast um, uh, because I do, I do think, um, you know, as you know, we talk a lot about, you know, the way you grew up and the way I grew up. And I think as you get older in a way, it becomes more relevant. Yep. It becomes more raw. And I, you kind of have to, to, to go back and really revisit it. But when you, you remember the time with this guy, was that one of the first time you became cognizant of the magic, like the infinite magic of art and what it was? No, I, my first, that's such a great question, man. Think, my first thing, my first thing, and this is why, like I said on my Instagram, this would be good and it's gonna be good. My first thing was really, really young, and I, I think it was before words, I really do, that I would like to um, draw with felt tips. Mm -hmm. And I remember, but I might be making this. Do they this have images of the, of the stuff you drew when you were a kid? No, they don't. They don't have those? We don't, which sucks, uh, but maybe. His drawings that he did when, when he was a kid are so great. Remember yeah. Muna? Muna's got them. Yeah, they are, well, anyways. Yes, yeah, sorry. Take it, take it from me. Next time. But, but, but let me ask you this, like, and I, I just ask you this because this is a preconceived notion that I have great. about <clears> England <throat> and about you, and I might be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. is I remember in the 80s finding myself in like a kind of a real lower end working class poor neighborhood of England. I can't remember, might have right. been Leeds, might have been Manchester, I can't remember where it was. How did you end up as a I was playing at some little club and I went wandering, you know, I don't know. But, and I ran into these kids in the street. I was like 22, 23 and I ran into these kids in the street and they were the meanest, hardest oh, yeah. kids with like death in their eyes that oh, I've dude. ever seen in my life. And I'm not kidding, these kids look I've, like they would slit your throat in a second for a penny. And that was, I was scared of them, that was the vibe they got. Yeah. And they came running up and they were just like about to like, I felt like, okay, I might have to take these kids out. <laughs> and I'm wondering, so I always kind of, that's my image that I have and yeah. I wonder if you were like that. Dude, totally. Now my, the weird thing about me, the weird thing about me was I grew up around violence from as long as I can remember because um, my family were violent, my mom was violent, my sisters were violent, my father... Uh, what do you I, mean by violent? Uh, they would physically attack one another. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and actually, we just went to England and we, and we really got a reminder of this. It was interesting, for Christmas, again, you think you've left it and you haven't left it. And um, so there was all violence in the home, but on the streets of Leeds, um, What's interesting about the north of England is this, you know, here in this country, you've got race, right? You know, don't go in the black neighborhood, right? Don't go in the da-da-da. In the north, it's all class. So yes, there's race. Yes, there was Chapel Town, which was like a black neighborhood, but they kind of had it together. The Jamaicans, in a way, were like, hey, we got this culture. Right, we're doing. But, but do you feel like it was more, like when you say classes, it was more like it didn't matter whether you're white or black or Asian or whatever. No. It was just like either you were poor, like poor, Poor people were pissed at rich people and rich people Yeah, the scariest person I can conjure up is uh, a guy from Leeds who's a skinhead. This is like 1983. He's a skinhead. He's with a group of other skinheads. He's been like glue sniffing all day. Mm -hmm. And he has such exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. There's a murderous energy. Now, the guy's not trying to be a criminal and make drugs and, and hustle. Yeah. He just wants to create violent chaos. Yeah. And there's something about that like white- gets off on just creating violence. On just being violent. So when I was really young at school, and I, I, it just clocked to me recently how young I was, I was probably like nine or 10, at the edge of the field of the school, 
there was this thing called the ridge, which my show here is called the ridge for that reason. But there was an all-weather all -weather pitch. Do you know what an all-weather pitch is? Yeah, dude, I'm going to freshen it up. This is normally moon. It takes a long time on the match, and now I'm like <laughs> chattering away. And, and uh, there was a skinhead gang that would come up off the ridge, and, and I, I once got, that should be pretty good, pretty good. Attack. See how beautiful this thing looks? You can't see, right? Can you see the color? Uh, anyway. um, and, and so, and, and, and you know, they, they, I remember consciousness and ending up in hospital. And I was very, very young, and that was not seen as weird. That was like what happened. It wasn't like, Everyone you know, there was a scandal. Beat. You're yeah. going to get your head kicked in at one point when you you're walk definitely in the street. Going it's going to happen. Right. Do you feel like, like you grew up in a time like before, like now you're going to get shot? And back then you got your, because I know no. when I was a kid in LA, like in LA public schools, kids came to school with knives, they yeah. fought after school. I mean, yeah. people got stabbed, it just happened. Right. But now they get shot. Right. And, and that, it's just different times. I think in, in the North there's still, and, I, and it's a weird thing to say, but, but I think there's a visceral, shooting is too distant. Mm -hmm. If you shoot someone, there's an abstraction there, right? Yeah. They, they can be, but there's some, there's some need for this physical right. contact, right? Yeah. And you sort of, can you still hear me by the way? Oh yeah, there's this need for physical contact. And so going back to your question, I grew up around all this very intense, I'm still recovering very from physical it. physical intense. Very physical intense, people spitting on you when they talk uh -huh. to you, people biting you. And, and, and would, would you call your home a nurturing home? No, my- It was my, a violent, cold home. It was a violent, cold, but here's the interesting bit. My mom and dad were freaks. They were real, proper bohemian freaks in a way. But in a way that, like you imagine bohemian freaks here and they would have a crystal store and they'd be, they weren't, they were bohemian freaks who were really scary. And my father finally, and I, sh I should put this up, put up slide number six. My father, when I was about that age, ended up in this place. What is it? It's a place called Hyroids. Now here's what's amazing about England too, they will name it. They will name that fucking thing. So I grew up in a neighborhood called Meanwood, right? In England, in America, that'd be called, you know, Flushing Woods. Mm -hmm. In England, they're like, no, it's Meanwood. That's what, that's what the fuck it is. And that was called Hyroids. It was a secure a psychiatric facility. And so when, my, when I was about eight or nine, my father completely lost touch with the rally, but in a frightening, violent way. So he was locked up in this place. So this place became famous for abuses. And I used to go visit that. Yeah. Go see him in there. And it was crazy. It was like something out of, um, I mean, it was terrifying. Yeah. You know, there were people who thought they were cats. And yeah. I mean, like dudes who had murdered so people. people. And, and so my father spent a small period in Strange Ways, as in Strange Ways, Here We Come, yep. by the Smiths. Um, and so by the time I was nine or 10, he was kind of gone. But he'd left me this oddly quite good legacy, which is mm -hmm. he loved music. So my dad would pay uh, on repeat Magical Mystery Tour, loved Magical Mystery Tour. And I'd open that album, you know, with the fat lady with the spaghetti yeah. and I'd be like, what the fuck? And he'd, be, he'd play me, I am the walrus. Yeah. Imagine that song with a dad who's losing yeah, reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so it'd be like, I am he as you are, he as he you are me it. and we are all together. And it was making perfect sense yeah, to him. Yeah, it was well, making perfect kind of, sense. It's kind of a beautiful song about the connectivity of what we all are one. Yeah, I and think that, that the song is about all of that. It's about escaping, because John was from Liverpool, very similar culture. Yeah. And he was escaping that by using his imagination. So my dad, there was that, and then my dad had this book on the Middle Ages. He had yeah. this giant book on the Middle Ages, and we would pull it down together, open it on the carpet, put Magical Mystery to on, and look nice. at things. I mean, think about the combo. That sounds great. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And one of the amazing things that he gave me was a legacy of music. He was a, what you call a Northern Soul Man. Yeah. Uh, all the, the, the black music from Detroit, from, you know, mm -hmm. um, Motown, Motown the whole bit, but even the really R&B stuff and reggae because my dad really liked the Jamaican community. It's really big uh, and, and, and so he loved reggae. And um, so it was like music and weird art, yeah. you know, like middle ages and stuff. And right. I'm sure that I would lie there with him kind of looking at this stuff, slightly frightened, and, but, and, but But, but it was, was it a time when you would like let go and imagine what things could be without, like you could just absorb yourself in these other worlds that were kind of mystical and, and, and just let your imagination run wild? Yeah, you said something really beautiful the other day and it should be said, our preparation by the way was Flea comes over for about half an hour and goes, can I talk about anything? And I was like, sure. 
And then he was like, you told me this amazing story. There, there was the two things, yeah. of being in your room yeah. and being relieved when your parents were gone. Yeah, I wanted them gone. Yeah, t but tell me, because that, that, that's... Well, like you, I mean, like when I was a kid, I grew up in a very violent household. And my stepdad, who was the one that was around as much, would get hauled off to jail constantly. And he had guns, and it was violent, and it was just absolutely unsafe and crazy, and I was right. scared to be in the house when I was a kid. But even before that, there was so much chaos going on that for me, the greatest time when I was really little, I remember they would close the door, turn out the lights, and I would be alone. I'd put the blankets over my head, and I would have this really rich imaginary life, all these imaginary friends and characters, and we would hang out, and I would talk to them, and we would sing songs, and we would travel to mystical places, right. and it was beautiful, and it was the first time I remember in my life feeling like I could be me right. in that time. And like when I could be breathe. truly me, not right. trying to please anybody, not trying to live up to like what the world's idea of what someone was supposed to be, just be free and be me and be freaky and let me wave my freak flag. I, I, but, I, I think, you know, for me, very, very early, and, and you know, as you get older, you start wondering like, well, how the hell did I do this? Like, what, how on earth, like all my friends were doing all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Like, but I always had that exactly that. There was a space that I could go into when I drew and when I looked at things. And I would like space out. I'd look at a pattern. I'd be at school, right? Yeah. School was a nightmare for me. I, was, I didn't understand anything that was going on. And as soon as you left the classroom, it was like glue sniffing and people trying to like, they'd sharpen plastic to try and cut your ear off. You know, yeah. there was people, people were ingenious. You know, they're like, I've sharpened my sneaker yeah. so that I can remove your nostril. And they'd be like, why? <laughs> why did you do that? Yeah. And I'd sit in the class and, and, and uh, the, the world sort of would go into patterns. Yeah. And I used to be in like such a reverie. Yeah. You know, everything would be patterns and I'd be drawing and I'd start yeah. thinking of weird stories. Yeah. And that always, so going back to the violence, I was really good at projecting violence. Yeah. So I, I rarely got beaten up because everyone's like, well, he's redhead. Because you scare people. I was scary. You knew how to scare people. Yeah, I knew Did how to. Did you fight a lot? Uh, I boxed. I boxed. Right. That's the, the flattened nose, which in the art world, I don't often get to talk about yeah. that. But I boxed and I was a good sprinter. Yeah. I, and, and I was a good, I was, a, I was really good at projecting out uh, I kind of like, don't right. touch me, you know? Right. And, and that was a constant energy that put out. But meanwhile, I was looking at like the Middle Ages and going, I wonder if like I redrew this with purple and green. Yeah, yeah. If that would be great. So right. I lived this very odd kind of life where I'd be like, I'd be on the street, be like, what? Yeah. What'd you fucking want, right? Yeah, yeah. And then inside I'd be like, I like this guy called Picasso. Yeah, yeah. He's weird. And another thing was b books. And I know this with you. We really, I mean... It's all uh, I wanted to do when I was a kid was really right? all I wanted to do. You know, it, it, it's funny, I, I, you're talking about growing up in a dysfunctional home or a, a violent culture or a violent household, and none of that seems remotely as scary or insidious or disgusting and scary as the art business. Yes, I think it prepares you. Very good question. I mean, the art business seems like Luckily, one of those, my like gallery is not out there. Thing. That's good to know. That mm -hmm. No one from the art world is going to hear this. <laughs> um, I think, I, I mean, you know, I, I, that's a really good question. I think, you, you know, you often talk about this and you're totally right. I mean, and I often come to you. This should be pointed out. I'll yeah. come to him super broken and be like, how do I do all these things? And he's a real pull yourself together Australian in some <laughs> weird way. He'll be like, yeah, dude, you know that through all these different ways, still the good art comes out. I'm always like, you're right. Um, but I want to be wimpy. But um, I do agree with you that there's this, okay, so there's this artistic thing and you go on a voyage with that and it actually starts to become a viable way of living your life, right? right? And then there's this business component as you go through. Now, most of my life, the art world was not present, not because I didn't want it, because it didn't want me. Right. I, you know, but I had this adamant certainty that I was going to be fine. Right. Like from age four, I was like, people would ask me, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to be a visual artist. I'm going right. to be really famous. It's all going to be fine. And everyone, like, can you imagine in Meanwood Leeds? They're like, uh, yeah. do you want to join the army? And I'd be like, no, 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 don't worry, dude. I got this. I'll yeah. probably sculpt, make paintings. They're all yeah. like... What the fuck? And I think as you, I had this adamant certainty about that, but I really agree with you that as you go on, you have to deal with the you reality survive, man. of, yeah, of the scene around you. I mean, you have to play stadiums, yeah. right? You have to tour. I mean, your touring schedule last year 
is brutal, yeah. right? And, and that's not funny. But you, at a certain moment, as an artist, you have to take a deep breath and go, OK, there's an aspect to this that's pretty dark, pretty well, there's, weird. There's nothing that you're going to do that's good without suffering, period. I agree, totally. Or chaos. Chaos is suffering, yeah. Well, me, I live me, by them. And, and do you know that song, Darkness and Doubt, by the Mekons? It's a Leeds band you know, called I don't the, know the Mekons. Mekons. I know of the Mekons, but I know songs here it and there. It says, but Darkness and Doubt, Just Follow Me About, is the, is the, is the lyric. And, uh, and it's a typical Leeds song, of course, but it really applies. Yeah. You know, you need that darkness and doubt as a motivator and as a sort of survival yeah, well, thing. Well, speaking of needing darkness and doubt, let me just ask you this question. Right. From your childhood, and this is you know, a pretty simple question. I, I don't really know. I, don't, you know. I think a lot of things I kind of know the answer to the questions, even though I probably don't. Right. But did you grow up and into your childhood feeling like something was inherently wrong with you, like something broken inside or something that made you different than other people at all, or no? Absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. and, and by and, the way, what I did... Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, go on, go on. What I did, I don't know about you, I, I, I think we might share this, yeah. was <laughs> I knew it, right? I knew yeah. it, I knew it. And then I managed to find ways to compensate for it and kind of over, um, overact out for it. Right. Right? I'm in a period about in the last four years. I grew up about four years ago. I was still, if you'd have met me at 15 and you'd have met me at 38, I was pretty similar from a nervous standpoint. My nervous system was fight or flight constantly, right? And that was because I wasn't really dealing with the complexity of how I felt. And recently, I've come to really like that broken guy. Yeah, yeah. And that, really well, take so care of him. Gotta love your, you know, I don't think you can ever outrun the traumas of your youth, but you can learn to love them yeah. and love who you are and grow from them. But, right. but, but, and Psychology 103. <laughs> I'm said, loving no, this. But, but, this um, is like my number no, one. No, but, but, but my question was, like you as an artist, like right. I think of you as like this hard fucking artist. Like your work is so physical and intense and conjures demons and really like I, I'm not an educated person, but I get powerful feelings from art. Right. And I feel a lot from your art. But my question is, do you feel that you have to be have that like broken part inside of you to make it? I think that... Um, Do you have to have it or is love and beauty enough? I think love and beauty is enough. My, my, two, three years ago, I would have said you have to have it. Now I'm of a belief that in some ways it, it, it helps and it hinders. I think uh, it helped for a period. It's like rocket fuel. It's like raw rocket fuel. So when you have that trauma and you have that anxiety and you have that push, it gets you off planet Earth through the atmosphere really fast. Is, is anger a big part of it? Anger, sadness, regret, all these things. And I wanted to wage war on the world. Right. Right? I looked at Leeds, and particularly when I went down south to London, I was like, you devils. Because, you know, you grow up in Leeds, and you think of England as a super poor country. Right? I mean, I'll give you a great example. My school burnt down, and they found out that it was a kid at the school who burned it down. Right? So he tried to burn it down once, and it kind of was three, you know, three quarters fine. So we carried on doing the classes, and then he came back and reburnt it. And that time, this is no joke, and this time it was about a quarter still there. So I remember sitting in classes that was something out of like a Star Trek Armageddon thing with like burnt asbestos and stuff, with, with snow coming in, with this acrid smell, right? And I'm still, of course, like drawing shit and making up stories, but like wondering, like, are we gonna move to a school with a roof soon, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so finally they're like, yeah, it's gone too cold. So they ship us to an all black school in Chapel Town. Have you ever heard of the Chapel Town riots? They precursed the Brixton riots, right? So you've got like Irish, Pakistani, Indian kids showing up at the Jamaican school that's already packed. You know, it's already over capacity yeah. and there's another 400 kids like, hey there, yeah. we're joining your school. So when I got to, to London, suddenly I realized England was rich. Right. right. I was like, people have Rolls Royces and stuff and there's museums and stuff. <laughs> so I did, there was rage there and it like that stayed with me constantly that didn't really make sense when I came to America because as a white person in America to be super angry in that way, everyone's like, what's up with you, dude? Yeah. Like, you're white, yeah, for yeah. God's sake. And um, 
And why so nervous? You know, me and Mona always laugh. Like if a cop pulls up by me, I'm like, I don't think I've done anything wrong. I paid everything, I'm good. And Mona's like, you're white, it's totally fine. I'm yeah. like, no, 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 I think he sussed me out. Yeah, yeah. Like, I <laughs> think the cops look at me going, you're not the average yeah, well, white it, guy. It, you know? Yeah, and they, I, well, I spent so many years like driving, I like, never had a license, never had a registration, always had drugs in my pocket. Yeah, like, right. Always <laughs> driving like this, you know? <laughs> like, always thinking every time I saw a cop, Stiffen up, drive real slow, drive right. the speed limit. Yeah. You know, until I finally got, like, they started pulling me over and asking me for my autograph. That and must I had have all been stuff, amazing. You know. Oh, no, but, with an English accent, the cops are great in LA. Yeah, yeah. They, you yeah, can have an assume, Uzi in the back. You're like, no, yeah, what about assume, Diana? Oh, they just assume you're sophisticated. So sad she died. Yeah. And they're like, well, in but, this country. But do you get, like, like, like your, your sculptures, like, I've seen you. You should see this guy in his studio. I don't know if you know this about Thomas, but he's a raw stud. If he takes <laughs> off that jacket, he is buff. And he's like, the dude has these giant mountains of clay, and he gets in there, and it's like this ferocious <laughs> physical fight with the clay. He goes to psychic warfare, physical battle with this clay yes. in there. Yes. And, I'm, and, I, and, I, and, and it's so cool, like I can relate, because for me, music is such a physical, almost often violent experience. Well, I, and, I, I, and I wonder, like, do you get into a fury when you do it? Oh my God. I mean, I, uh, and I think, again, you'll, you'll relate this. There are long periods in my studio where I will catch myself in underwear, nothing else, with a giant pile of clay, with music like deafeningly loud yeah. across all the space. And I'm screaming yeah. and doing these, I, to call them dances is a disservice to dance because I'm, I'm effectively, <laughs> You know, like, I'm, I'm preparing to boil blood, you know? And, yeah. and there's an amazing, I, I, this, this is only a statement you could make. You'd help me go see a band that I wanted to see, and you were like, you know, Flea's one of the most loving people you'll ever met. And you see him on stage, and I'm like, even I thought you were a guy who'd like tear my neck out. Like, you come to my studio and be like, give me your eyeballs. And meanwhile, he's the softest, gentlest human. But you were saying there's a, there was this band, and I went, and they were great. And then we were both like, yeah, they're great. And you said this comment, you were like, it's a shame there was no blood though, right? Or blood or chaos or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, or no blood ritual, like a sacrifice, Just human sacrifice. And I know what you mean, that there's a zone, I think if you have that nervous system and if you've grown up in that, that you have to act out and sublimate that crisis and that right. energy. And there's something about an art studio, I've been thinking a lot about this with Donald Trump and power, right? Art, why it's so important, is that you get to act out violence. You get to act out chaos. You get to act out rage. You get to play at it. Yeah. Right? And but you return it. back with an awareness of the limits of that. You, you, I mean, you know that thing. I'll go in the studio and I'm like, I will change the universe. Ah! And I'm fighting. And at the end, I'm ashamed. Right. I look at my work and I'm like, I'm the worst artist that's ever lived. I'm a scared little man. I don't know if I can even drive home. What am I doing? I should be with my kids right now, right? Well, I know you like that. It's an emotional coaster, right? And that vulnerability allows you to go, shit, right? That, that's not real. And I think one of the dangers in our society, just because this is on my mind right now, is it, it has to be, it's on all of our minds, right? Is the moment that creative space is lost in a culture. It starts getting acted out in real, right? People actually start really, so that's why at the moment with Trump, it's like, he's not real, is he? He's got to be kidding, because we're, we're accustomed to that being acted out. And when you experience it as real, like yeah. it's the, that's someone who's then lost their ability to be creative. And so yeah. with this election and with violence in various neighborhoods, yeah. violence in Leeds, it's terrible violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because those people no longer have a belief in a creative answer yeah. that you have and I have, yeah. right? We have a creative answer to the fear. Yeah. Well, it's weird. It's like I was talking to a friend of mine, a black friend of mine the other day, and we have this funny relationship. We always say racial jokes to each other. Right. He calls me like a white cracker motherfucker. Right. You know, and I call him Which a dark. you are, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I call him a darky. You know, we have this joke and we like laugh about race. We make race racist jokes to each other. Yeah. And it's like all of a sudden we're sitting there the other day and we're talking and 
And we're like, with this Trump thing, it's like, we like, I said, we can't make those jokes anymore, huh? It's not fucking funny. Yeah, and he's like, yeah. And it was like this despondent realization that like this most absurd reality has sort of become our reality. And it's yeah. so weird. And I, I was thinking like, you know, Trump's been going on about this wall, this absurd wall that he wants to build. Right. And, and everything. And it's so like sad and like symbolically like disheartening. And then you built your wall. Yeah. I, there's and a great... you've recently have the wall. Can we show your yeah. wall? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the wall first, which is number 42. Yeah. There's a lot of images I now see. 42. That's the, the wall I made. And I want to... There's a good story with this. Show uh, number 45. So I first uh, made that for the show. I was, I'd made this group of black paintings uh, for the South Gallery that were a kind of mourning, um, emotional kind of pause about, you know, a friend that had died some years ago. I finally was able to mourn it. I was mourning my own transition from one state that I'd been into another. Because I think in a way, you, you do at times kind of symbolically die, right? Kind of yeah. leave something behind. And there were very, there were these sort of sad, melancholy, violent also, because I was thinking a lot about, about that stuff and excavating that stuff. But I also wanted to do this sculpture about love and togetherness and sex. So I'm making this, this is really very big, right? I mean, it's like you can walk inside of it. And the idea is you walk through kind of what looks, uh, I mean, it's kind of like you're walking inside someone's belly or through their sex into another kind of sex organ. And, and then you look up, you're in it, if you see it, you're in it, you look, when you're in it, which means you walk in, you walk around, you go inside, when you're in it, you become part of the sculpture. So when someone's looking at it, you're part of it too. You are the sculpture too, right? And there's a hole in the back. If I show you the back, which is number 44, there's a hole in the back, and you can escape through the back, and when you're in the inner thing, you look up at the sky, right? So you get this like, thing on the sky. So I was in this whole kind of thought about uh, the kiss as a subject, but also the mother and child, sculpturally as a yeah. subject. The kiss and the mother and child have been long, 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 long subjects in sculpture, and they lend themselves to sculpture, the idea of a sculpture inside a sculpture, or a sculpture kissing itself yeah. or touching itself. Incredible, I love so that. So I was thing. doing that, and you could go in, you go inside it, and the sound changes, and you it's know. so warm and, and good, warm and like futuristic and, and old all Yeah, and it's kind of also like a yeah. teleporting thing. You get in it, and you teleport off to another world. Yeah. And so we had worked really hard to do that. Yeah. And we were like proud and excited, and the gallery were like, wow, he's on schedule. This is something I'd never been on schedule. I was, I was a couple of weeks early. I was like ready to take a vacation. Yeah. And Trump, and this is the first time this happened in my life, was Trump got in, um, and it'd been like bugging me the whole summer, this thing of the beautiful wall. I'm going to build a beautiful wall. And it was like, something's wrong with you saying that, me being a sculptor. Like, Fuck you, you don't get to tell a beautiful, like, you have, no you have no criteria for that, right? Just on a formal level, like, he wasn't president yet, but I was like, how dare you formally say that? I can make beautiful walls, not you, orange man, you know? And uh, just purely, uh, not politically, but, but actually, I was offended. It'd be yeah. like someone, it'd be like Trump being like, I can fucking play the bass amazingly. You'd be like, what? I'll fucking show you the bass. It was coming from that place, yeah, yeah. right? But when he got in, when it actually happened, I couldn't finish this. I just, and this has never happened to me before. Always I've been able to sublimate and push through. You know, I don't care about politics. I'm gonna make art. And actually a big part of me was like, uh, shall I make you another one? I got it, I got it, you talk. Yeah, okay, you may. I was, I was thinking that, yeah, well maybe love and togetherness and the bodies being together and being in a womb in a way and inside a penis is all good for America right now. But I couldn't finish it. I quite literally couldn't get to do it. And, and uh, you know, I was talking a lot with Muna, kind of trying to get myself, well, tomorrow I'll go in and finish that round thing. Yeah, but just for those of you who don't know, we keep saying Muna. Muna is Thomas's partner, alter ego, lover. Yes. And she's right over there. She's, she's right awesome. there. She's an yeah. amazing human. Yeah. An amazing and can, human. And wait, but can, can, can I just like go on to a tangent yes. that's related? Yeah. 
when I first, like when I first started to get to know you, you had just made the Moon Room, right. which was dedicated to Muna. Yeah. And I walked inside of it, and I once heard about, I met this architect guy, and he was talking about this ancient architecture that they made, and it's a science that's lost to architects now. And it's probably maybe you, maybe people out there who are smarter than me and more <laughs> well-learned will know that they made these, this, these ancient buildings. I think there's some old churches that had it. It's this science where they knew how to make a room that harmonized with the human body. Right. So as soon as you walked in it, you felt like this wild sense of relaxation and connectivity to everything yeah. and one with everything, this enlightened feeling that was incredible. I always imagined about it, like, wow, what would that be to feel that like? And, it, and I heard about this architecture, and I went into some old churches that were supposed to have it, but I never felt it. Right. But when I first met you, I, worked in, I walked into the moon room, and I felt it. I just wanted you to go away, to yeah, leave I in remember. there. I was going to break down in <laughs> tears. I felt so beautiful and connected to everything. And how did, how did you do it? Like, if, can you show the moon room? Yeah, That's the, the moon, moon room. room. If you go in that thing, I'm telling you, I never had a feeling like it in my life. I was vibrating all over. I felt this incredible sense of like peace, and I felt like an insignificant nothing, like I was connected to the true divine powers that be. And, Thank and you I don't so know much for if saying you just that. Got... Isn't that incredible that he says but things like that? This, and he's, that's the deal. Um, I, uh, you were the first person other than like family and friends that saw the moon room, number one, which is an interesting thing, right? I'm gonna do your, we're doing each other's match, we're like a married couple. Um, you were the first person, and I was very unsure about it. I wasn't even sure if it was a work of art. I'd been in a period where I was making lots of art and banging away and being in the art world and all of that, and I went through a kind of crisis, and the moon room came out of me effortlessly. It was the only wow. effortless, is that right? Effortless, effortless piece of art I'd ever made. And you're right, there were works where I fight them and it's horrific and they humiliate me and I humiliate them and we have this love-hate horrible relationship. And when they go out in the world, I'm like, leave me alone. I don't live with my own work. I don't like my own work most of the time. When collectors are like, I live with your piece, I'm always like, I'm so sorry. If you need a refund, you know, talk to, to Larry. Yeah. But with the moon room, with the moon room, I really remember watching you as the first visitor. I felt you were like, leave me alone, don't talk to me right now. And, yeah. and I was like, no, I don't really know you well enough to like leave yeah. you in my studio. But I felt it. And I was very moved by it. And you began to do yoga. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> yeah, it's like my first studio visit with Flea and it's like he's doing Bikram yoga in the, in the drawing room. But it was amazing. And I think that that piece, um, I've had a long-standing love of like temples. I remember when I was young, like watching those National Geographic and Jason and the Argonauts and all these, this idea of an alternate physical reality, right? And the idea for me, the movement kind of came out of me because I wanted to build a space for people I loved outside of the art world, outside of LA, but in LA, yeah. right? Where people I loved and cared about could kind of come in and I, I was struck at that time, and I still am, by pointless space. How important pointless space is. Well, it's like when you're a kid, like, and so this goes into something I've been thinking about a lot, too, is how crucial is pointless space. Yeah, like, man. I think when I, when I was a kid, I remember, like, you know, I went through a lot of turmoil and stuff, but there were these times when I would just try to lay down on the ground in the grass, or if I wasn't staring into the sky and just trip out. Right. And I really fear for kids today who spend their entire lives looking at a screen yep. and never having that time to just let their mind wander wherever it might go. Right. And, and, and I, um, well, I think I drank a little bit of yours. I oh, that's it was okay, yours. we can share. Yeah, I'm it. healthy. You know, I'm yeah, I know. Healthy. I'm, I'm not, so sorry. So, but my, I, like, I think about like the greatest musical geniuses that ever lived, like, Johann Sebastian Bach, or Charlie Parker, or John Coltrane, or Jimi Hendrix, or Louis Armstrong, like the people who I really admire, like who did the greatest things that changed everything, every bit of music that we hear, and the people who really like gave the template for what we consider to be culture, you know? Right. And, or musical culture, anyway. And, and, and I think about like Bach, he didn't even have an electric light. 
Right. You know what I mean? He had yeah. like a candle and he sat in there and he composed this incredible stuff and churned it out all day long. And, and then, you know, distractions have become more and more to the point where people spend their whole days distracted by stuff that has nothing to do with them and nothing yeah. to do with their spirit. And are we going to lose the great creative genius that we're capable of, the human potential that we're creative of? And it scares the hell out of me because for me, that's where all optimism and hope and faith is and the only, like that's what the Ponce de Leon eternal youth is. Right. It's like you could be an old ass man or woman and your creative spirit and your curiosity is alive, you will always, like your child will always live inside of you and you'll always be vibrant. Well, if you think about it. Like, can, can there be geniuses still? Is it possible? I absolutely think that there can be. I think it's an odd time. I think we go through, as a human culture, let's say we're, we're a worldwide human culture, right? I don't think we progress, number one. I don't believe in progression at all, period. I don't believe in it in art. Because if we did progress in art, then there'd be better composers than Bach, there'd be better plays than Shakespeare, right? All these things. In art particularly, you, it's one of the activities that really, really highlights that time is irrelevant. I agree with it, it is the fountain of youth, which is, I'll never forget as a young kid, going in, not that young, but like in my 20s, so I was pretty young, going into Florence, right? It's like on the Euro, whatever it was, you got that ticket. And uh, I'm walking into that room at the Academy of Michelangelo's work, and I never really thought I cared that much for Michelangelo. I was like a young punk, you know? Like, I'm gonna change everything, and you know? I'm being struck by him. It wasn't made in the, in the 1600s. It, it existed completely timelessly. And that struck me, and it never left me. And, and that's why I go to museums, that's why I listen to music. Because it, it's a reminder that time is, 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 it's possible for time to disappear, right? And, and everything else, warfare, we get, we get better at killing people, right? We get better at, in capitalism, we're like better at selling people things. But in art, it's a stark reminder of that truth. Number one, that everybody born is scared. They, are, they know they're gonna die. They're going to fall in love, probably. They're going to have sadness, da, da, da. Whether it's in 1200 or 1600 or BC or whatever. Art reminds you that that's the conditions that you go into, right? Yeah. And the complexity of that. But it also um, allows you to see through all the bullshit in front of you, I think. And so do I think it's easy for great stuff to be? I think it's hard. I think it's hard because so much is coming at us. And so much... I yeah. agree with you, like it's so Man, hard well, to... I, I was just like, today I was driving down the street and I saw a billboard selling something and I saw the billboard and I was like, my fucking enemy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, this is like when I was a little kid and I would let my imagination run wild in my room and then I'd hear my parents yelling, arguing or something and it, like all my little imaginary friends would run away and hide and I'd be left alone in the dark yeah. because they distracted me from the beauty of what I cared about. And I saw like the billboard is that. Yeah. And now these days, like, shit, I go to a basketball game and I'm sitting there and I'm like watching like, you know, a six foot nine walking poem run past <laughs> me with a basketball. <laughs> and I'm like, that's so beautiful. And I look down the row and like 20 people are sitting there looking at their fucking phones. Yeah. And I'm just like, we're, we're doomed. We I are don't, fucked. I don't think so. I think in the middle ages, these fuckers were looking at something else. They yeah. didn't have phones, but they were like scratching right. their nuts. So it's, so it's all just another, it's another thing. I think it's another manifestation, but I do think that art needs to be fought for. And this is not really, you know, art gets a bad rap. It's like, you know, music even gets, oh yeah, fucking musicians, yeah. you know. But music, when you talk about temple, right? Yeah. For me, before I could even dream of museums and artworks and having yeah. a studio, music can take over a room and turn it into a temple, yeah. right? And, and in a way, I think that art gets blamed for a lot of things that, that, that and, and kind of, um, it becomes a scapegoat. And I think we as artists, and I think art, artists, music, dancer, politicians can be artists. I do believe everybody can, can, can apply creativity to what they're doing, and it will generally work better, yeah. generally work better. The Republican Party should be creative, 
And if they go in creative, they'll be weirdly kind of happy about it. It's a weird thing with creativity. So my opinion is what we have to fight for right now is space for art. And by that, space for pointlessness, space for space, for just for the hell of it, room to breathe. And space uh, to nurture. Space to nurture, nurture like your music and nurture school. kids. Yeah, your music school, for example. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many people know this, but Fleet runs a full-on music school in this city that my daughter goes to. Um, Are you going? Chen goes, no, Chen. Oh, Chen's going. Chen's gone. And, you know, and that, you know, seems kind of, um, once you've done it, it's like, great, there's a music school. But actually that fight to keep space open for possibility. It's everything. Is everything. It's everything. Absolutely That's the thing everything. We gotta, but I, 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 like I said, and like you just said, the creative spirit, which is like this infinite thing that feeds us all and can turn any space into the most beautiful thing. And like, I pray that, you know, both of us on our deathbeds get to be looking at beautiful art, like listening to Coltrane. Yeah. You know what I mean? Listening yeah. to music that we love, like, you know, because that will never, ever lose its magic. And that's the only thing in the world that I'm really certain of. You yeah, know? me too. There's, 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 there's nature, right? Yeah, but then, there's but, love. Yeah, and, and there's, there's art. art. And, and, and it's that Which coin. is us making sense of nature and love. Yeah, you know, right. But, but like, like um, I just, I, I feel like the arts aren't, you know, like creativity, you can be the most creative garbage man in the world and be giving as great of a gift as Picasso. You know For what I sure. mean? Or a lawyer, or a plumber, or, you know, anything. If you you know what I mean? The arts aren't the only place for creativity. And I know that when I walk down the street and someone smiles at me, authentically that I feel like that's the most beautiful creative thing that anyone could ever do. I, I, I agree, I think when you're aligned in the thing, I agree man. And this, this is interesting because we've gone like an, on an arc from violence and, and fucking hatred to like love and, and, and um, I do really firmly believe uh, now, as I, as I sort of approach, you know, I'm like middle-aged or I'm older than middle-aged, I don't know why I am, I'm 40-something, yeah. um, that it's very simple. It's like, it's a simple task, which is to add to the beauty, right? You get up every day and you have options to add to ugly, to make things more ugly, and you have the option to make things more yeah. beautiful. And if I look back and I look through the people that have inf influenced me, I think of, you know, say, Joseph Boyce, right? Joseph Boyce said everyone could be an artist, artist is social action, et cetera, et cetera. But he also began the Green Party in Germany, right? Which is now evolved into, you know, full on Greenpeace, ecology, the whole bit. And those two thoughts, which is Joseph Boyce making a drawing in a room and dreaming up the Green Party are actually linked. That, that's, where that, that's where the Green Party comes from, not being to being in my opinion. And I think the thing that, you, that worries you and it worries me too, is that crossover, that, 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 that celebration of art that allows this kind of crossover into the world and allows a feeling of empowerment in yeah. art. And I think as long as I agree with you that people are like, hey, museums are where you go and you look at art and those are skilled people. Those are skilled cross people that do this thing called art. There's a problem. I think you should land in LA get off the plane and it should be filled with art yeah. as you drive around. I think like, you know what I mean? Like I know in this audience, there's Paul McCarthy, this, one of the great living sculptors. I think he's here. I hope he's here. He's here. I always think there should be a Paul McCarthy sculpture as you get on the 405, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I think there should be a Mike Kelly sculpture. I think there should be, I think there should be video art. I think it should be everywhere. everywhere. And I think the idea that architecture is the only social space where we're allowed to be a bit arty. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right? It's fine. I'm but glad. We, we for can it. make art out of anything. Yeah. I think there should be spaces that are, that are pointless. I think there should be sculpture. I think there should be painting and, and stuff everywhere. I think it should be as full and present in our life as those billboards. Yeah. As a compromise to that, as a way. And so my dream when I sit in the studio, yeah, I often get this accusation, well, you're making this big stuff. Is that because of the art market and the da da? I've always made big stuff. When I was like nine, I was dreaming up, like maybe I could make a giant sculpture park where it would be a kid's play park and would be this thing. That dream, I want to make sure, 
stays a kind of reality. So every time I go into a studio and I fight and I make these weird, mad things, right, that cost money and, you know, you're always kind of confronted by like, what am I doing? If I just made small stuff for a bit, yeah. I'd make some money, I'd have some savings. Yeah. Um, but that pushing that space and pushing that social interaction, um, even when the world doesn't want it, I really care about. Yeah, and I feel like now is the time for that more than ever, and I feel actually really optimistic that the current climate in the United States, which is extending itself all over the world, you know, um, is that maybe we've been sleepwalking for the last, since the 60s, and maybe now, like, this is the greatest thing, and, we're, and right now we're entering into an era of the most conscious period of activism and civil rights yeah. and love and togetherness and us all coming together and right. really like sh creating a laser beam of light that you know right. will, will touch the world for history you know and I think that we might have the greatest opportunity right now for us all to really create there was love. definitely Are you coming to put the, the hook on us uh, <laughs> I definitely, so I don't know how many people are at that, that women's march in, in LA, but what I'll, what I'll tell you, and my, and, my, and my kids were there, it was amazing. What I'll tell you is number one, women's march, a women's march is the nicest march on the planet. <laughs> Men's marches, it's tear gas and people shouting and people <laughs> yeah. robbing people. A women's march, as a dude, they were like, hi, right? And, and so number one, Women's March, that Women's March felt like that to me. Felt like in the face of this thing we've just been handed, right? I agree with you. The only way to look at this is it's a gift. Donald Trump is a weird kind of gift where it's like, oh, okay, let's recenter, let's recenter, let's remind ourselves what we do, let's actually get some energy from this. And I felt that in that Women's, in the, in the, in the march yeah. in LA. And, and I think it's, I agree with you. I think that is the only right way to look at it. And let's let's like like come together and have faith and hope and let's remain active and vigilant and conscious. Right. And care. Right. Um, right. We got we we got these these questions here. And right. before we start them, I have two questions. The first question is for you, and I just wanted because I wanted to ask you it. Yes. Because I remember like. When I, in the 80s, and when I first started, like, you know, Chili Peppers started, and I started, like, having a real career, as in, like, being able to pay my rent, making music <laughs> and stuff, and, I, and I, I, um, I remember, like, I saw Basquiat paintings, and I discovered Basquiat, and I thought, I want to make music that sounds like that painting. And I, and, and I wonder, did you ever, like, hear music and say, I want to make art that looks like that music? Abs totally. I mean, for me... My first love, weirdly enough, was music. Uh -huh. What did you love? What was the first thing that just drove you crazy and touched your heart and just um, got you going? You know, for me, uh, you know, it was because I'm in the north of England, it was the Beals. And because, you know, Liverpool, Leeds, the Beals were played at my house. And also, I'll never forget this, and I know you'll, you'll relate to this. My dad one day, is like, we're gonna go to the Working Men's Club to, to listen to a jazz concert. I was like, the Working Men's Club of Leeds for a jazz concert. <laughs> and I was like 13, so I was already, That's and he had really come called. out of hospital. It was called the, the working, working Man's Club of Leeds. I love it. And my dad had come out of hospital and you never quite knew what to believe with him. It was like, we're going to the Working Men's Club to look at jazz? Okay. Yeah. And we go, and I think I've told you story, and it was Art Blakey and the Jazz Messages, right? In Leeds, in this, shitty club. I mean, shitty club that was about, you know, half Jamaican, first, second generation, and then white working class dudes who were really working, you know, the working right. men's club guys, Yeah. you know? And I'll never forget watching Art Blake, he came out, he carried the symbol, you know? Yeah. A symbol, symbol. Yeah. I, even young, I was like, that's a symbol. <laughs> yeah. I get it. <laughs> Dude, I got you. And he put the symbol on, you know, yeah. and he just started. And the sound, I didn't know who Art Blakey was. I thought it was a cool name. Yeah. Because it was like art, you know. And he played to this group of people and it blew me away. And that, I actually was like, I want to be a musician. That's what I want to do. I really, I had no idea yeah. he'd come from America, really. I didn't know. But it blew my mind. This is where my dad had a wonderful legacy to it. My mom, too. Yeah. And so for me, music was like a, a force of 
completely held off the real world for me until I realized I was not musical, really. I was a good listener. Right. And I was a I lover of it. music. You're a liar. No, I'm not really. No, you ask yeah. Muna. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> everybody is I'm like this. But you my just... first love was music. <laughs> and, and ironically, and this is where life's really, really weird, I'll never forget you being in that video, and I was a kid, where I think you were in Joshua Tree and you were climbing around in rocks. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> That, so, and I remember being, this is how weird the world is. I was like, that dude's weird. What the <laughs> fuck is he doing? But I remember thinking, that's kind of what I would do. Uh, you know, you were like in a yeah, womb and the, you know, yeah. right? Do you remember that? Yeah, Am yeah. I making that I, there, there's a couple of those ones. I, think I, so I was a Red Hot Chili Peppers fan back in the day, yeah. right? And, and so for me, music was always, like when I get yeah. down, when I go to the studio and I look around, I go, fuck, it's like awful. And right. I've seen shows of other contemporary artists and I'm like, we're doomed. I'll play music to feel like we're not doomed. Right, yeah, well, right? I mean, it, like, uh, I think it was Louis Armstrong who said, is it washes the dust off everyday life. Right. But, but um, I think we have to do these questions. Okay. Um, but when, wait, were you talking about I the video? I don't want to end. I feel like we're just warming yeah. up. There's I a know, second wind. Too. This is nerve wracking up here. <laughs> um, did, was the video, wait, did we have like a big, did I have a big sweater over my head? Yeah. You know what's crazy? It's a quick little story and I'm regressing and tangenting. Great. But when we made Great. that video, I, we, we had these things, we had these like funny suits, right? right? And it was cover all of our heads. And when I, we'd shot the part where I was dancing, right. I had just gotten, they, I was good about to get the results of my AIDS test. <laughs> oh, and if you were like me in like 1989 or 90 and you were getting results of your AIDS test, you were scared to fucking death. And, but we were out in Joshua Tree and I couldn't get reception. So I had to drive in like an hour to go get reception away from Joshua Tree to hear it. Like, please, oh please, I don't want to have AIDS. And I went to get the rest of my results and um, uh, my friend, River Phoenix was right. with me on the shoot. God bless wow. his beautiful heart. Right. And it's him. I, he pulled the sweater over his head and acted me, and it's him squirming around. It's not me. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. like that. And I've never because said that story before, but it's Woo! not me. I love okay. that story. But, but anyways. Because you were trying to get your results. Because I ran, I was scared, and I was like, he was like, I'll do it, I'll do it, go. Meanwhile, I'm looking at that going, this guy's so free, and he's, like, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> he's in California. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're like, am I okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Samantha, I have a quick question for you. These questions are all for Thomas, right? Because they don't say who they're for, they're for Thomas. They're for both of us. So how do we do so that? So this is from Twitter. Okay, here's the first question, and I'm gonna ask it to you. Yeah. Because this is really your But day. if it's like, when did the Red Hot Chili Peppers come <laughs> together, I'm gonna hand it to you. What would you, what would you tell today's teens about how to make your passions into your career? Wow, what a great, well you probably could, no, I mean, I'll you. go first. I'll go first quickly. Number one, this is a, a guy in Leeds gave me this advice, and it's been solid. Don't be good at anything else. You know, when you're at art school, there are people like, I'm gonna learn photography so I can become a digital photographer while I'm da da da. Don't do that. Just be terrible at everything. It's brilliant, it's dangerous, it's a dangerous edge, but just be like, I can only make sculpture out of clay. That's it. So my jobs I always did, and by the way, when I was 34, I just arrived in LA and I did construction work for 12 bucks an hour. And there was definitely a moment when I was like, I should have learned some computer shit. Maybe <laughs> there was definitely a moment, definitely a moment. I'll never forget saying to the foreman, do you have dust masks? And he was like, yeah, out on the street. And I was like, got it, no dust masks, you know? Um, I definitely wished I had computer skills or had some skills, but the skills I had were always to do with making art. And I do believe if you're gonna be an artist, do it. Go for it. Be There's no shame in it at all. Be completely all. willing to fail. Be completely willing to fail. Have you ever, I, have yeah. you ever failed completely at art? Oh, uh, most of the time. I don't like to say that because I like, keep buying it, but 90% <laughs> is a failure. 95, actually yeah. 95 is a miserable failure. But that 5%. 5% is worth it. Yeah. And that, that would be my other thing. There is always, like I'll go, th I've actually been through six month bummer spells. I couldn't do anything. Everything I did was horrible. I got to a point where my own line, like first line, like I'd have a piece of paper and I'd do this and be like, disgusting. <laughs> You're disgusting. Like I got to that level of analysis where I was like, but what happens if I did the line accidentally? 
and he'd be like, still disgusting. Yeah. And that, um, still, in that misery and in that sense of dryness, every morning I'd be like, but maybe the line was quite good. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So even today, like, I just made the most horrific thing last week. I mean, horrific. Yeah. Like, amateuristic, like, emotionally pathetic, yeah. the whole bit. But still in the morning, and I knew it, really. I was driving home, like, fucking hell. Yeah. And then in the morning, I'm like, but maybe, yeah. you know, if I added orange to it. I, so I, I think there's always that staying in that optimistic I, I, thing. I always feel like it's a matter of, like, you get up, you go to work, you make what you make, and you fucking get into it, and you're not going to be hit by the cosmic ray of love every time. No. As a matter of fact, once in a blue moon, yep. you might feel like, wow, I'm really doing something good. But in all that mundane work, you look back at it and like, wow, some of that's pretty good. You know, and right. I can turn that into something that might be worthwhile and might touch someone's heart. Right. And that's all you can hope to do is to touch someone's heart. I agree. You know. So um, what, what advice would you give to a kid? Oh, what I, advice I would I'm give to a kid to is, is um, to be yourself and you are the only person in the world that is yourself. And, yeah. you know, it's the most precious gift and give it and it's the most beautiful thing. That's it. You know? Beautiful. And, okay. and, and be willing to fail. Like I look back at myself as a kid and I look back at how, like, scared I was and how I walked around with these knots in my stomach feeling like like bad things were going to happen, you know? Right. But I can look back at myself and I can be like, God, you were a beautiful right. child. And right. we're all beautiful. So anyways, that's that. That's okay, what's the next question? Next question's for you. I'm going to ask it to you. How has, and we've talked about this, but mm -hmm. let's, 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 it's good too. How has the current political climate impacted your music making practice? Well, no more than all the climates in the world. I mean, look, like everybody, I care about freedom, I care about love, and I care about all of us knowing that we are all one. And anything, whether it's commerce or politics, or corporate greed that gets in the way of us knowing that we need to stand against, period. We need to stand together. And as an artist, I'm always just trying to create freedom with what I'm doing and to tap my spirit for whatever it's worth and give what I can. And everything influences that. You know? I, I think that, I was, I, was, I was thinking about this, and I think that you know, when he, when say someone like Trump gets in, so someone was telling me the origin of the word devil is de-will, to be de-willed, to be robbed of will. They, I, I might be making this up, but it's a good story. So devil, de-will, right? And I like that because when Trump first came in, I was de-willed. I went in my studio and was like, I'm a useless person. Like what, I'm going to make like another bulbous thing and it's, everyone's going to be like, that's it, we're voting for someone else. But actually, here's what I realized, and you've said this to me many times when I've been down or de, de willed which is actually, I realized, ooh, that's that devil's work. To feel like you have no impact and to feel like, well, I'll just buy in then. You know, I should join an NGO or da da da. No, actually, I think this current climate has made me more energized after a period of de -willment. Yeah. I was like, oh God, I can't do it. And now I'm like, motherfucker, I'm going to make art every day. I'm going to literally talk about it every day. Yeah. I'm going to talk about how much I disagree with this. And I'm just going to talk about love and togetherness and weirdness. And I'm going to make room for freaks. And I'm going to make room for freakiness in myself. And I'm going to live this thing harder and, and more completely um, and, and look at it as that. I'm like, dude, and we're California, man. Yeah. I mean, we are California. This is an amazing state filled with creative people, filled with crossover. I mean, we, as you as a musician, me as an artist, friends who are filmmakers, writers, we can talk and we can come together. We're incredibly powerful, you know? And so I feel that now. I'm like, fuck this DeWilman shit. Yep. That's like devil's stuff. Yep. So anyway, it was my little... I've been talking about that a lot. Um, the next question is, what impact do your children have on your lives? Have you made works inspired by them? 
Oh man, um, yeah, I um, really look at uh, the occurrence of children coming into my life as a massive transformation of me as a person. And, um, and it's probably, you know, other than being born and eventually dying, it's probably one of the most powerful things. It might be more powerful than being born and being because I don't remember either. I remember my kids being born. And I, um, in the last years, have been blessed with alignment and with feeling love and with ha having great friends. And in that, I realized that the studio that I used to look at as like where the, you know, the lonely dude goes and be creative miserably, so Jackson Pollock, Van Gogh, is actually bullshit. Um, that whole idea of like the lone, you number one, you can't make art alone. That's a lie. Van Gogh had his brother, he had all sorts of freaks he hung out with. He was picking up information constantly. That's a 20th century bullshit lie. You must seek out connection and your family and the, and, and so once I realized that, um, that my studio became a place for my children to play yeah. and make stuff, um, that transformed my whole idea. And I've made sculptures for B, I've made sculptures for Abe, I've actually made sculptures and paintings for Chenna, even if they're like, no thanks. I've yeah. kind of made them <laughs> thinking for them. And, um, and we have a lot of our kids play dates, as you know, like at the studio where kids make things. And what I learned from that is kids are natural sculptors, actually. I didn't know that because I didn't get my hands on sculpture till I was like a little older. I just used to make stuff out of mud and put dog shit in it and do all of that. But actually, kids confronted with a pile of clay make the most extraordinary stuff, like, easily. You know, I'm like, what is that? And they're like, it's a giant volcano with a face and this thing, and then it moves into a temple over here where there's a water slide. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> like, how did that happen? Clay and kids and these things are very natural. So for me, um, I've made a ton of work for kids. I make a ton of work for my friends. Their voices are in the studio a lot. You know, you, you're on tour, I don't see you as much as I normally do, but your voice is in my head constantly. Um, Muna's voice is a massive part of the studio and my children's voices and their creativity and their energy and their forcefulness. And yeah. what about you? I mean, I mean for me, it's, it's kind of a wild duality. Like, my kids are everything to me and I... Um, of course, love them more than anything else in the world. And I yearn to have as bright a spirit as they do. And I learn from them and they give me everything. Right. But at the same time, I become really absent from them because I go work right. and I go away to play concerts. And then I hold myself up with my instruments and I'm, I'm writing right now, leave me alone. I'm at the piano, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, I'm, you know. And yeah. so it's, it's this wild thing. And I, Kids are so smart, like they inherently, like even like for both of my kids, it's been hard because I've been, my whole adult life, I've been on tour, it's how I make a living, I, you know. I have to say, I, I, uh, watching you this time, I've never watched you this deep on tour. And you know, you know when uh, you, you, you see celebrities and they're like, it's really hard and you're like, yeah, come on. Yeah. You're <laughs> like, let's be honest, it's fucking amazing. I've witnessed that brutality in a way, right? right. With you and right. the things you've had to give up to go and play music and to go and do that. And I know that it's everybody's dream and that's also part of it and you, I never hear you moan, but there is that- I moan that, from time to time. Not really to me. You yeah, not yeah. really moan with me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always the moaner. I'm, I'm always thinking our relationship. I'm always like yeah. and, um, and I do think that as a musician is a, is a, power, is a painful and powerful thing. So you have to go out and give like that. And I think your children get something from that. Right. They know you're that guy doing that, but it's a painful. Yeah, well, that, but the thing is they do inherently know. And they also yeah. know like you're the donkey pulling the cart when you're mm -hmm. doing that, you know? Right. But I, I mean, for me, like every show that I do, I, I collapse. I go right. till I collapse and then I, right. you know, go again and I, and I end up walking around like just half dead all the time, but, but you know, what we do is our life's mission, right? What we right. all do, and I think the worst tragedy that could ever happen to any human being is that they don't sing the song that's inside of them regardless of whatever they're chosen, um, whatever that song is, whether it's, you know, digging holes or just whatever yeah. it is, the thing in, 
do your thing, you know. Um, and the, the next question, I saw it on there, and I, I, I was going to ask it. It's funny because I had it on my list. There. I had this. I haven't referred to it. I made a list of stuff to talk about, and I thought, well, if we get stuck, you know, I'll go to the list. But <laughs> I did too. I don't, yeah, <laughs> but, but anyway. Um, I mean, I don't know if we're boring or not, but, 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 um, and I don't really care. Actually. But yeah, yeah, I'm having a great, I'm drinking massive amounts, yeah, yeah. industrial <laughs> amounts of matches. Yeah. So for but me, but I, I just have one, one, one question to you is there someone asked like, um, uh, do you have any pre rituals before you begin making art and music? And I know before I do every concert, I sit and I warm up and I stretch and I run and I have like a series of scales. I play my, you know, my minor scales and my Hungarian, you know, augmented ninths all going and stuff so I can go out and forget and just perform. But do you have a version of that? Do you have something you have to do to get in a zone before you start? Do you have rituals? Yeah, what I do, um, it's weird, and, and it's weird, is I, I, you know, I'm very scared of that art making process. Like when it takes me over, it's very scary to me. I'm being, to be honest, I've, I've never said this publicly, but you know, you go into the studio and I kind of potter around. Yeah. I like, I, first of all, I make a music playlist yeah. on Sonos. Yeah. So I like go through my music playlist. I, I make a matcher. Yeah. I, um, I live with a series of images. So let's, I just should show this. Put up number two if possible. Oh, you've got it. I live, my drawing room is filled with images like that which is my work, things that have influenced me. Uh, you can see all sorts of stuff. There's a Leeds hooligan in the middle. Yeah. One of the ones that's most disturbing that I'm only just starting to earn is to the top left, there's Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, who murdered women around Leeds when I was a kid, and he terrified me and I hated him and all this. And I, I look at that. I sit and look at it, yeah. having, pretending I'm not looking at it. So I'll be kind of sitting there, but it's a giant board. You've seen you it, and like I'm like, like making, watching you like mother. And it's watching me, and I'm watching it, yeah, and we're yeah. going into that thing, right? Huh. And then I do the music, I do the match, and then, as Muna knows, I do a thing called a walkthrough. I'm like, I'm going to go check everything's okay. What does that mean? What, the sculptures yeah. like moved in the <laughs> night? <laughs> and Muna's Dude, like, okay, you go check that's everything. That's when you walk, you feel it. Yeah, I walk around and I act like a, I, I'm innocent. I'm like, well, that was weird. I wonder who did that and this and yeah. that. And I'm like, well, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, a, I'm a tourist. Yeah. And, um, and then slowly I start getting pulled in. You know when water goes down a sink? Yeah. But you know when you put something in it and it's doing that and then suddenly it's like, yeah. and I do that series of stuff. I walk around, I do the music, I fiddle about. I have weird topics I care about suddenly, yeah. like, no, anyway, da, da, da. Yeah. And sometimes I want to do business, pointless yeah. business. Like, has anyone recently emailed? And everyone's yeah. like, no, it's fine. And I'm like, no, oh, you know, I'm doing all this bullshit. And then, I Next get thing caught. You know, you've gone and you just gone yeah. in the zone. Yeah, and then but, something will drag me in, be it a painting or some clay or so. It, I never know quite what it is, but okay. something will pull me in, right. and then I'm gone. Okay, let me ask you this. Yeah. Well, actually, let me ask the audience. Would you like to hear the story of when Thomas nearly chainsawed off his cock in the studio? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Okay, so I have this. <laughs> I like this story. That's why. No, it's I a great him, story. But, you know, it's it's a it's a great story, and and, it, and, and it's uh, uh, there was a number of fantastic near near death stories that I was doing yeah, at that time. I like this one. And they were connected to alcohol <laughs> and drugs. Weirdly <laughs> enough, they were they were linked. By the way, neither of us drink or do drugs or anything, which for two rock and roll guys is kind of interesting. We're very hard line. We do yoga. We run together. Anyway, we learn from our mistakes. Yes. And, uh, and it's be wonderful. Be smart, don't start. Yeah, it's wonderful not to be out of it. Is what I, I, and anyway, so I used to only work at night and uh, there was some sort of tempting the God of chaos that I would do the most dangerous work at night alone. And it was some kind of Viking ritual that I'm sure like my ancestors would be like, oh, that, you know, kind of thing. So one night, I'm in there and I'm working on a piece, a wooden sculpture, and I don't do much carving, to be honest with you, partly for this reason. And that sculpture is going to soon be donated to LACMA, which will be great. It'll be in LACMA soon, this wood thing. I just gave it to LACMA. I'm really proud of that. It's the first time I've ever done that. And I'm carving with a very big group of chainsaws that I can't really handle. Now, in my mind, because I'm from Leeds, I can handle anything, right? It's like, hey, dude, do you know how to use an Uzi? And I'm like, yeah, pff, I don't, you know? Can you do a mortar? Totally, you know? And I've got these chainsaws, 
So uh, I'm getting more and more tired. I was drunk, and I was up and down ladders. I had flip-flops on. I'll never forget. I'm looking at my, my feet going, I probably shouldn't have flip-flops on. It's like, Ee! you know, with like an 18-foot thing. And I'm super amateur. By the way, I have no technical skill whatsoever. So finally, in an attempt to be a little bit more sane, I get a smaller chainsaw out, not knowing that they're the most dangerous. You know, like if there'd have been a, a health and safety yeah, guy, yeah. be like, dude, an age yeah. old mistake. Yeah. So I get out this mean little fucking chainsaw to be more safe. And I'm going at it like me and it's all jiggly and great. I'm like, Meh. I feel like I'm, I'm fighting a fighter pilot. Getting you know, into it. it's like me yeah, and yeah. I'm pretty drunk. So it's all great. And, shit, yeah. so, and my t-shirt, I'm wearing four t-shirts because it's freezing, gets caught in the mechanism and the mechanism turns and like a Bond movie, you know in a Bond movie that thing's going towards yeah, yeah. the crotch? Th my t-shirt is pulling the chainsaw towards me. And you right? couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop it. I could try and hold it back, but then my, you know. So I'm doing this weird dance around my studio and with a high. chainsaw. Yeah, and I was watching it happen going, wow. So the chainsaw starts coming through my t-shirt, right? And actually starts touching my skin very gently. Just at the moment, the t-shirt goes fully in and, and blocks it. So if you see that piece in LACMA, that's when I stopped. <laughs> if, if you're wondering, why didn't he finish the back? That story, and that's really a true story. Yeah, right. Another question, let me answer, um, Chris. What do you think about LA emerging as a contemporary art capital? You've been there a long time. Um, I don't really pay attention to who's an art capital or who's not yeah. an art capital. I don't really care. I mean, I feel like at different times, and it's one of the things that I kind of lament that we might have lost with the age of the internet, is the ability for communities to create movements that are very unique to their communities, and, and, and because everyone's getting all the same stuff on a computer, right. so they're less likely like to be like, well, in one neighborhood, they do all this because if that's just what they're getting into, because they're talking to each other and creating their own unique cultural movement. But now everybody is getting the same stuff on the computer, and obviously it still happens, but, but not as much. And I don't know if LA is, a, I just don't know enough about that. I mean, I feel like you can go to Pitkin, Montana, and see as good art that some old lady made in her guest room totally. than, you totally. know, than like the art capital of LA. So I, I, that's my opinion. My, my thing on that is I do think that when I moved here to LA, all my European friends were kind of like, well, good luck, dude, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're and now they're around. all like, yeah, I'm gonna come out for a couple of months and look around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's definitely a change. When I first moved into my studio, Salazar yeah, yeah. was a car paint. Thing, yeah. So I'd have fumes. Yeah. Now it's a fantastic restaurant with really lovely meat smell yeah. in my studio. So s clearly something's happening. Do I think it's good? Yeah, probably, yeah. If, if there's good energy. But I agree with you that some it does feel then it gets marketed and all of that, yeah. and it's like, looks the same. But I just feel like what's, what makes a great art community? People are making art, people like are making art everywhere. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, and I think, I think one of the great things that we're learning uh, uh, from a curatorial standpoint is we're looking back, all this art that was made. Mona just got this yeah. double book about black art in the South. Yeah. It's a double, this thing is a tomb. and. It's unbelievable, right, Mona, the amount of incredible stuff that you're looking through and you're like, why have these people, you know, obviously I yeah. know why, there's racism, right? But I'm looking through and I'm going, shit, there were so many untold stories of people making amazing shit yeah. in like weird... And it gets dismissed as folk art. Yeah, or, or it's folk outsider art. or yeah, whatever outside, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or and it's, you know, yeah, folk art. I don't believe that, and I think, again, that's the joy about art. Art lives outside of context. So I can make my stuff and get all this excitement and buzz, yeah. and in 100 years, everyone will be like, yeah, it was pure bullshit. Yeah. And then some weird dude in Glendale, you know, yeah. who's like doing yeah. something in 200 years, it'll be like, shit. I just, and that's the truth yeah. of it. I just, I just, a lot of times, it. I feel like, like I know you need to call things things so you can refer to it, like this is impressionate, this is figurative, this is what, but I feel like it pigeonholing art of any kind into categories is such bullshit. It's such like, bullshit. Like I remember it's once like going to bullshit. see, like I, I, I'm a huge, I used to play with this guy called James Chance. He had a band called The Contortions and he was like someone I really admired and I played with him in the early 80s. And he turned me on to Fela Kuti. And he said, wow. you gotta hear this guy Fela Kuti. He's like the James Brown of mm -hmm. Africa, he's incredible. Anyways, this is like 1984 or something and I got 
really into Fela, and I got all his records, the Africa 70, and all this stuff, and it really opened up this world of incredible music to me. And I remember going to see Fela play, like I saw him play a bunch of times, and one time he played at this world music festival. And he came out on stage and he goes, don't fucking call me world music, fuck you America. <laughs> he said, he goes, I'm not world music, I play Afrobeat from Nigeria. Right. Like, like, you're gonna call everything that's not American or everything that black people from other countries plays world music. Right. Because we're gonna, you know what I mean? And it's like, I don't play music like they play in Ghana. I don't make, they play music like they play in Brazil. So a lot of times I feel like, like art gets pigeonholed out of like, people thinking America or wherever they're from is the center of the universe and people like just like pigeonholing things th together out of laziness. I think the 20th century, one of the, 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 the bummers was scientific thought went into cultural thought, meaning, yeah. you know, the hyperdeductive model, right? Yeah. Where, you, where you, they're facts and they build and they add yeah. up and da da da. Yeah. Art doesn't add up. It, you know, everyone's like, well, Picasso did this, he did yeah. the Demoiselle d'Avignon, yeah. which led to this. No, the Demoiselle d'Avignon could have led to a million crazy yeah, yeah. things. Yeah. You know, it just happened. If you replay yeah. it, it's like those people who are like, oh, if you play this backwards, it's telling you da da da. It's as crazy as that yeah, yeah. to assume that, that Suzanne does this, so Picasso does this, and da da da. And then yeah. we end with like conceptual art. Yeah. Conceptual is just crazy. I mean, conceptual has yeah. always been going on, painting's always been going on. People are always trying to deal with the conditions of their life in all sorts of weird places. Yeah. And I think this whole idea of that, that model, you know, yeah. is still taught and it's total fucking bullshit and it's very limiting, you know? Yeah. It really is. And, and so I like to think of art as this free flowing, ebbing and tiding, up and down. If you're some young dude and you're like, you know, I want to do figurative painting, yeah. that's as viable as someone going, hey, I'm going to open up, uh, a, you know, a social pro program. Da -da -da. It's that you, are, you stay creative yeah. and that you stay looking at the world through a creative lens. The rest of it's all nonsense. Yeah. Um, he's question. telling us over there, we got to stop right now. But stop I, right now? I, I, just, I just wanted to say okay. a couple of things. I, I don't want to stop. i got to be before, honest. Normally, I want to get off. I think stage. we should. We, yeah, no, this is kind of fun. Everyone's <laughs> listening to us. We're really important. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, Super important. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, we're going to go backstage and like congratulate each other of what, how great we are. But, <laughs> but um, I just wanted to say one thing. i got to pee so bad from that matcha that I want to stop anyways. Yeah. But I just want to say that, that I love this country and I feel grateful to be here and I think it's a beautiful country and I have nothing but like that I think that we all can create love and have a great, great time together, all of us, all flavors of people, all kinds, even people that think nothing like we think or I think or you think or whoever thinks that we all have to listen to each other and love each other and I think that... Um, Art is a great, great opportunity to do that. And I want to, like, thank Thomas, thank you for asking me to do this Dude, with you tonight. Thank you for accepting. And, Come, and, and, and I, and, um, I want to say, coming off tour fucking yeah. four days ago, yeah, yeah. thanks, man. I, oh, yeah. I, it's, it's really wonderful. Thanks. So many people came. It's amazing. I know a lot of you probably are like, Flea's here, but that's, but still, that you came to see Flea talk to me <laughs> is cool. And, um, and LA is such a great city, and thanks for so many people coming out and listening to our crazy shit. Yeah. It's great. How wonderful is that? Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thanks for your questions, man. Um, so, peace and love to all. Fight the good fight. Good night. Yeah.